<laughs> All right, good to see everybody. Now, as I, uh, I explained a couple weeks ago when I had the opportunity to preach then, that when Jesus came announcing that he was ushering in the long-awaited kingdom of God, people wondered how that could be the case when things like sin and suffering and sorrow and death, when those things continued to exist. You see, they thought that the introduction of the kingdom of God would mean the immediate elimination of all those things. And this is this, you know, represented like that. This was their understanding and their expectation of the kingdom of God. And Jesus corrected their misconception by teaching in a number of parables, including the two that we looked at two weeks ago, that the kingdom comes in two stages. Ah, there it is. See, there's a, there's a subtle, less obvious stage that's associated with Christ's first coming when the kingdom is sown and it coexists with the old age or the old order. And then there will be this dramatically obvious stage that results from that sowing or that inauguration of the kingdom by Jesus. That will happen at the consummated kingdom at Christ's return when resurrected people will live eternally in the immediate presence of God in a heavenized creation in which there will be no sin, no death, no mourning, no pain. It will be the divine utopia. This is the kingdom that people have hoped for ever since Adam. And so this is what Jesus comes announcing. Now Jesus also told parables showing that the kingdom of God he was bringing is good news for the needy. And one such parable is the parable of the two debtors which we're going to look at here a little bit this afternoon. Now that parable, it, it occurs only in Luke chapter 7, verses 41 to 43. And as I indicate up here, we're going to shortly, we'll read 7, 40 through 50. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the background and the circumstance of the parable because I think it'll help us really get at what Jesus is trying to communicate. Now, the parable of the debtors, it's Luke 7, 41 to 43. And Luke tells us earlier in chapter 7 that a Pharisee, who we learn later in verse 40 is named Simon, but he says that a Pharisee invited Jesus to have dinner with him at his house. And we're not told the reason for the invitation, but clearly Simon was aware of Jesus' reputation as a prophet. You can see that in chapter 7, verse 39. So, we're not, we're not sure the reasons. He knew Jesus was a prophet. Whatever reservations he may have had about the claim. You know, we don't know what he thought of that claim, but we know that he was aware that Jesus uh, was understood and looked at as a prophet. So, he, we have this invitation. He's aware of that reputation. Why did he invite him? We're not told. Perhaps social custom. Maybe that dictated that a visiting religious teacher be included on the guest list. Or maybe he was just curious. Here's somebody I understand is seen as a prophet and I'd like to have him and rub elbows and talk, whatever, we're not told. But Jesus is there at Simon's house by invitation. Now the fact they reclined at the meal, that means it was a relatively formal occasion. Perhaps a banquet following a gathering at the synagogue. And the reclining, that was the normal position for eating special meals. Some kind of elevated type of meal. Each person, and you've no doubt heard this, uh, each person would lie on his side, propped up on his left elbow, with his head toward the low table on which the food had been placed, and then they would reach the food this way, and their body and legs angling away from the table. So this is how they'd be arranged there. At the, around the table. Now these special meals where this kind of eating would take place, they were semi-public, meaning the doors were left open and people could come in, uninvited people could come in and sit along the walls and listen to the conversation. 
They're not invited, but the doors are open. That's why I say it's semi-public. Now, Simon's a Pharisee, and who are the Pharisees? As you know, the Pharisees, they are a sect or a party within the Jewish religion that was noted for its piety and its concern for ritual purity. Paul, who was a former Pharisee, he describes the group in Acts 26, verse 5, as the strictest sect of the Jewish religion. And the name Pharisee, the very name, in all likelihood, that name conveyed the idea of separated ones. Now, possibly referring to their separation from ritual impurity. Klein Snodgrass, who wrote the book uh, Stories with Intent, that commentary on the parables, which I mentioned two weeks ago, which is really excellent. He says, quote, the Pharisees had a concern for purity at meals that we can hardly appreciate. In other words, they were so into ritual purity, for us it would seem really bizarre. But they were definitely sticklers for that. Now the Pharisees, they had invited Jesus, or they, they invite Jesus to meals at other times. You can see, for example, in Luke 11.37, in Luke 14.1, and they warned Jesus about Herod wanting to kill him. You see that in Luke 13.31. So one need not read anything sinister into the invitation that was given by Simon for Jesus to come because they invite him at other times. They warn him about Herod. So you can't just jump from the fact that there, there's something, you know, some sinister ulterior motive behind that. Indeed, whether it was in deference to other people or whether it represented his own perspective, Simon calls Jesus in verse 40, he calls him a teacher which was a title of respect and honor. Now, while Jesus is here reclining at the table, propped up on his elbow, he's there. He's reclining at the table. An uninvited guest approached him from behind. And it was a woman who lived in that very town. A woman Luke describes simply as a sinner. Now, the fact he names her a sinner means that she is a sinner in some distinctive way. I mean, it's not just like, well, we all sin. Yes, we all sin. But for him to label her a sinner, she was in some way distinctive or notorious. Now, she probably was a prostitute. But you can't be certain about that. But you can be certain that she is in some sense a distinctive sinner. And she approached Jesus with a flask of ointment or perfume Perhaps she's intending to anoint his head with it. And she comes up to him with that intent. But when she got next to him, she just broke down. So here he is, his head's up here, his body's angled this way. She's coming up, perhaps going to anoint his head. But as she gets near the Lord, she just loses it. She just starts sobbing uncontrollably. And she, I just picture her convulsing, crying, tears just raining down on Jesus' feet. And she undoes her hair and she mops his dirty feet with her hair and the tears that have fallen on it. And then she lavishes kisses on his feet. You see this crying woman just so taken up emotionally, crying and wiping his feet with her hair and just just kissing his feet and putting perfume on it. Now, that's powerful. There's an awful lot of emotion coming out in, in that. This woman didn't care about social propriety at that point. She was taken up in her gratitude and love for Christ and just overwhelmed by it. And so there she is just doing that. Now, since the woman brought the ointment with her to the banquet, it seems clear that she came intending to anoint Jesus with it, which means he had already touched her life in some significant way. His preaching was quite likely heard by Simon, by the guests, and by the woman. Now, for a woman to let her hair down in public, that was usually considered a shameful and seductive act, but sometimes it was done for the purposes of religious devotion or gratitude. Snodgrass says in his, in his work, 
He says, kissing someone's feet was the ultimate way to express honor, gratitude, and submission, but it was also an act of deep humility. I mean, that's, that still translates into our culture. You, if you saw somebody kissing somebody's feet, that communicates that there's something going on there about submission, gratitude, just trying to say in every way, I, I have no way of expressing to you my appreciation and devotion to you. And so I think that translates there. Now, anointing someone's feet, that would be highly unusual. And doing so with expensive ointment, that would be a very extravagant act. Snodgrass says, by letting her hair down, touching Jesus' feet even with her hair, and anointing his feet with her perfume, she contravened every social convention of the day. Were it not for her tears, the acts would border on the obscene. That's why I say this woman didn't care about that. She was caught up in the emotion of being next to Jesus, and this just came out. And whatever people thought of her, she was going to express to the Lord her devotion and gratitude and love for him. And that's what she did. Now, when Simon, the Pharisee who had invited Jesus, when Simon saw the sinful woman wiping her tears from Jesus' feet with her hair, kissing his feet, and anointing his feet with expensive perfume, he was indignant. That was his reaction. He was indignant. See, in his mind, Jesus' tolerance of this behavior, it proved that he was neither righteous nor a prophet. See, a prophet would know that the woman was a sinner and would not allow himself to be defiled by her touching him let alone touching him in such an extravagant way. A prophet would recognize that and know that. Now, the Pharisaic notion of sinners being defiling, that probably grew out of warnings in Scripture about associating with evildoers. You have a number of warnings like that. For example, in Proverbs 1.15, and 2, 11 to 15, and 4, 14 to 19. This idea of being careful not to associate with sinners. And that notion, it's reflected in a Jewish writing called Ecclesiasticus. Not Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiasticus. And this was written around 180 B.C. And it says, What fellowship has a wolf? This is a Jewish writing around 180 B.C. What fellowship has a wolf with a lamb? No more has a sinner with a godly man. And then there's this rabbinic tractate called Makilta Amalek. And this is a 4th century compilation of material that may go back to the late 1st century or the early 2nd century. So we're kind of in the ballpark with this. And this says, in this connection, the sages said, let a man never associate with a wicked person, not even for the purpose of bringing him near to the Torah, near to the law. Don't even associate with him to teach him the law. He's completely out. You just stay away. So you see all of this in the Pharisaical environment. And so that's what's behind Simon as he says, this guy can't be righteous. This guy can't be a prophet. He would know she's a sinner and he'd have no business with her touching him or anything like that. Now, what I love is that though Simon said these things to himself, see, meaning he was thinking them, though he said these things to himself, Jesus answered what he was thinking. He answered what he was thinking by telling him a parable. So here's Simon concluding that Jesus cannot be a prophet, and then Jesus responds to what he's thinking. That ought to guy, so Simon should have been going, hmm, what if I need to rethink this? But he responds to what he's thinking by telling him a parable. And here we go. Uh, this is Luke 7, verse 40 to 50. 
And Jesus answering, answering what? Answering what he said to himself, answering what he's thinking. Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed, him, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she's anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. Thus, she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now the point of that parable in verses 41 to 43, which point Simon confesses? Jesus lays out the parable, asks Simon, Simon confesses the point. Jesus says, yes, you're right. And the point is that the degree of love expressed to a forgiver is expected to be proportional to the extent of the debt forgiven. He says, which would love him more? Who's going to love him more? Well, the one who has the bigger debt given. You're right. That's right. See, so that's the point. The degree of love expressed to a forgiver is expected to be proportional to the extent of the debt forgiven. Now, Jesus then applies that point to explain the woman's extravagant appreciation of him and Simon's lack of appreciation of him. Simon didn't go out of his way to do anything special for Jesus in terms of hospitality. He wasn't hostile. He was just indifferent. He was just indifferent to him. He showed absolutely no appreciation of who Jesus is. None. He showed none of that. Simon didn't give, didn't give Jesus the common courtesy of, give, of providing water so he could wash his feet. And he did none of the things above and beyond common courtesy that would honor a guest, such as greeting him with a kiss or anointing his head with a... He didn't do any of that. Not even basic common courtesy, and certainly not anything that would indicate you're somehow in any way special and particularly welcome. He didn't do any of that. And the woman's deep appreciation of Jesus, it was due to her recognition of the magnitude of her guilt before God. She knew the size of her debt that had been forgiven. So he tells him, who's going who's gonna to love the forgiver more? The one who's got the bigger debt, he says, well, don't you see this woman? That's what's going on. Yes, she was a sinful woman, but she understood the magnitude of her debt that has been forgiven. That's why she's expressing herself the way you're seeing it. That's what's going on here. Therefore, she loved much. Joel Green, in his commentary on Luke, he says, when had she been forgiven? Now, because of translation issues, we a lot of times miss, miss the mark on this. Okay? Uh, we wind up having the parable say one thing and then we get down in the weeds and lose the point of the parable because we get confused on when, she for, when she's forgiven. She loves because she has been forgiven. Just as in the parable. But he says, he says when has she been forgiven? As in, the, as in narratives more generally, so here we're confronted with a gap in the storyline and we must assume some prior encounter to the effect of, the effect of which was her forgiveness. This is hardly unusual for Luke, 
who occasionally introduces persons into the narrative, who have already begun the journey of discipleship in some sense, though we're never told when or how. We, what we are told is that she had already been forgiven. So she had experienced that. And in keeping with the parable, you see, her extravagant love was a result of her having been forgiven. It was not a cause of her being forgiven. It was the consequence or the result of her being forgiven. Daryl Bach says the parable explains why the woman acted and her actions testify to the presence of forgiveness which produced love. Because the woman was forgiven much, she loves much. Her love is demonstrated by her actions so that her great love reflects the presence of great forgiveness. The forgiveness is not a result of the acts. Rather, the acts testify to love's presence in gratitude for the previous granting of forgiveness. That's what's going on. Yes, she was a sinful woman. Let's say she was a prostitute. Everybody looked down on her. She knew who she was, but she also knew that she had been forgiven. She had been forgiven. And when you appreciate the weight of your sin, you celebrate its being lifted. You completely celebrate it. And that's what's happened to this woman. And she's just having this pour out of her. Love and gratitude. You know, that sense it's reflected in verse 47, the idea that she had been forgiven first and then the love is the product of that, it's reflected in, verse, in, sev in several of the standard translations. I say some translations will, in my view, lead you astray here. There are many of the translations that render it have been forgiven. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. And I think that's the correct way to take it, you see. Uh, it's a perfect tense, and that's the way you ought to do that. That's the, the New American Standard, New Revised Standard, the NIV, the New American Bible, the TNIV, New Jerusalem Bible, Christian Standard Bible, 2011 NIV. Okay, it's not odd. Okay, now just there are some translations that don't capture that, and I think that's a mistake. And you also see it in a number of translations, not only in have been forgiven, but here, thus. She loved, therefore, she loved much. And the thus, that's from the New English translation, but you get others saying hence, like the New Revised Standard, the TNIV and the NIV says, as her great love has shown. In other words, it's a reflection of the forgiveness that she's received. Christian Standard Bible, that's why she loved much. All right, so you see that idea, that's what's happening. Now, the fact she expressed her appreciation to Jesus for the great forgiveness that she had received shows <clears throat> that she understood something of Jesus' divinity. She comes to Him to express her gratitude for her forgiveness. She, she knows something of His divinity or at least His unique relationship to God. Why come and pour out all of this to him? You see, she understood there's something about him in this process. He has been instrumental in my blessing. He has been instrumental. That's why I'm coming and I'm doing this to him. And so she recognized that. And Jesus does nothing to discourage her in this regard. And he even confirms her understanding by telling Simon... The you, when he says, I tell you, in verse, 20, in verse 47, it's singular. He's talking to Simon. He confirms here by telling Simon that her sins have been forgiven. And his saying, I tell you. I tell you her sins have been forgiven. It seems to connect him to the forgiveness in a more direct way than simply announcing that forgiveness had occurred. You see, when he says, I'm telling you. See, he's connecting himself to that. I'm telling you that her sins have been forgiven. And that's how the guests took it. The guests understood that. They said, who is this dude who thinks he can forgive sins? In verse 49. See, so he was connecting himself. She saw in him that he was instrumental. 
And she poured out her love on him for that reason. And he then tips his hand with that and saying, I tell you her sins have been forgiven. And so she was recognizing that. And then Jesus says to the woman, perhaps to reinforce or encourage her or to repeat it for the benefit of the other guests, he says in verse 48, that her sins are forgiven. Meaning her sins, it's another perfect tense, meaning her sins are in a state, a present state of having been forgiven in the past. That's how perfect works. It has an ongoing effect into the present, but it occurred in the past. So he tells her there that her sins are in a state of having been forgiven. You see, so he, he tells her that, which of course says that the forgiveness was something that had occurred beforehand. Now he is, of course, he is fully aware of the woman's sinful past. You know, when the, guy, when, when the Simon's looking at him, he said, mm, this guy can't be a prophet because he'd know what kind of woman she is. He's well aware of that. That's why he says her many sins have been forgiven. Do you think you're sneaking this past Jesus? I mean, he was well aware of that. He says, her, refers to her many sins having been forgiven. So Jesus, in saying that, by the way, he responds to another of Simon's thoughts. If this man were a prophet, he would know. So you're thinking Simon really ought to be waking up, right? Because he not only is answering what he's thinking by telling him a parable, and then he's letting him know, yes, I know who this woman is. You thought I didn't. You thought I wasn't a prophet because if I was, I would have known. But I'm telling you, I do. So what do you think, Simon? You see, what do you, what do you think about that? So Jesus here, he justifies the woman and her conduct toward him. You have Simon looking down his nose at this woman. She's a sinner. She's contaminating. Have nothing to do with her. What's he doing? She's over here just extravagantly loving on Jesus. And Jesus justifies her and her conduct toward him before the sneering Simon. And in the process, he makes a powerful statement about his identity and about the openness of the kingdom of God to the worst of sinners. Now, if there's any good news on this planet, I'm telling you here that the fact the kingdom of God is open to all sinners is the greatest thing going. You cannot sin beyond the grace of God. If you will come to Him, you cannot sin. In other words, you don't say, I don't care what life you've lived. I don't care how ugly it is. I don't care how ashamed you are of it. The fact is, is that the kingdom of God is open and that's what this woman is, is showing. She's showing this. As Jesus says in Luke 5.32 and also in Matthew 9.13 and Mark 2.17, he didn't come to call the righteous. He didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, the kingdom is not reserved for the religious elite. It's not for all the people wearing the big hats and all of the whatever it is and all of the normal people who struggle in life and have been pulled into alleys of sin and whose lives have gone ways they would have never wanted and didn't want and hate. It's not just for the religious elite. The kingdom of God is for all people, including the worst of sinners. However shamefully one has lived, one may join with God in His work and share in all the blessings of the kingdom. There are no stepchildren in the kingdom. There are no, we have you on this tier and you're here and you're really a full brother. There's none of that. You come in and you are participants with God's work here and you share in all the blessings of the kingdom. But Jesus, He also leaves Simon to wonder about His own forgiveness and relationship with God. See, whether Simon recognizes it or not, his indifference towards Jesus is a reflection of his lack of forgiveness. 
Though the contrast in the parable is between one who loves much in response to having been forgiven much versus one who loves little in response to having been forgiven little, the question it raises for Simon is whether one who loves not at all has been forgiven at all. You see, it is a warning and a challenge to Simon and to all people who share Simon's indifference toward the Lord Jesus. It is a warning to them that if you have that sense toward me, you need to wonder and be concerned about whether you have been forgiven at all. Because forgiveness produces love. And that's why the church, you see, what are we? We are a community of people who have been rescued, purchased, redeemed, saved. We've been, the burden of our sin has been taken off, so what do we do? We gather together to do what? Just to praise God. You see, we are corporately what this woman is individually. As she weeps and wipes his feet and all of that's us. As we come together and celebrate and praise him, what has he done? He's, he's lifted it for us. He's taken us. And we understand how deep our sin was, how big it was, how the weight that was there. And he's freed us from it. So what do we do? We just celebrate and praise him. That's what we do. And that's why we come together. See, and the kingdom is open for all. And if there's anyone here who is not a Christian, well, you know what a delight it would be for us to help you come to understand and to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we can help you in any way, if you're in need in any way, that we can pray for you, help you, you come and let us know, and we'll do our best to help in that regard. Let's stand and go.